Well, hello and welcome to this side event on regional approaches to combating transnational organized crime in the Pacific. My name is Virginia Comolli. I'm the head of the Pacific program at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and I have the pleasure to be your moderator today. This event is organized by the New Zealand Embassy to Austria and permanent mission to the United Nations in collaboration with the Global Initiative and the embassies and permanent missions of Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom and the United States. The Pacific Islands are seeing a surge in transnational organized crime, including drug trafficking, environmental crimes, human trafficking, cybercrime, and more. Tackling these challenges requires concerted efforts reflecting both the transnational nature of these crimes and the limited resources available to individual countries. In line with this, earlier this year, the Pacific Islands Forum released the first regional strategy to disrupt transnational organized crime, emphasizing the need for regional, whole of government and whole of society responses. The region already possesses a complex security architecture consisting of multiple organizations and networks. And today I have the pleasure to be joined by a distinguished panel of practitioners dialing in from across the region, with whom we have an opportunity to explore the role of key regional organizations in combating transnational organized crime, and also to hear how regional and national efforts feed into each other. With us, we have, in the order in which they'll speak, Michael Crow, who is a regional security advisor at the Pacific Islands Forum, Nicholas Brown, who is the executive director from the Pacific Islands Chiefs of Police. Uh, we also, hopefully, uh, maybe a bit later, will be joined by Chief Superintendent Kalisi Toifulao, who is Commander for National Crimes and Investigations within the Tonga Police. Also, we'll be joined a bit later by Jay Udit, who is the Chair of the Pacific Islands Law Officers Network and also the Secretary for Justice and Solicitor General of Nauru. And lastly, but not least, we have Mr. Josai. Josiah Naigulevo was a former public prosecutor in Vanuatu, a position he held between 2015 and August of this year. Uh, in addition, I'm pleased to hear that we have an expert audience joining us today, and we look forward to receiving your comments and questions, which you can submit in writing here in the Zoom Q&A uh, function, and we'll address them following the presentations. Before I hand over to the first speaker, I'd like to say a few more wor words as a way of introduction and context. Pacific Island countries are not the first destinations that most people would associate uh, with transnational organized crime. Yet transnational crime patterns have changed considerably in the 21st century, and especially in the past decade. And indeed, whereas the most recent Global Organized Crime Index produced by our organization uh, still places Oceania as the continent with the lowest criminality levels, activities such as drug trafficking, especially involved in synthetics, but also environmental crimes such as illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, among others, are significant and growing, albeit with subregional and national level variations. Human trafficking, illegal logging and mining, financial crimes, and increasingly cyber-dependent crimes are also present and require information sharing and cooperation across the region, and frankly also beyond the region, if they are to be addressed. There are multiple factors that drive uh, transnational organized crime in the region, including globalization and increased connectivity, technological advances, high demand for drugs, especially in Australia and New Zealand, and the influx of foreign criminal actors who come in all shapes and forms. Of great concern, some of these foreign actors are not simply driven by profit. Some also aim at gaining political influence and possibly interfering with domestic politics on behalf of their countries of origin. Needless to say, this brings to the surface a new set of challenges that are then linked to the race for influence in the Pacific Islands in an era of geopolitical competition. Mm. So what are the regional and national level actors doing to address these growing and evolving criminal challenges. And that's what we are, we'll be trying to unpack today. Um, to start us off, I will now turn to our first speaker, Michael Crow, to introduce the work of the Pacific Islands Forum, especially following the release of the first regional strategy to disrupt transnational organized crime. Michael, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Virginia. Just checking everyone can hear me okay? Yep, I'm seeing thumbs up. Also, thank you very much. And look, to uh, all our friends and colleagues uh, that are joining us online, firstly, thank you. Uh, thank you to GITOC for uh, convening us uh, tonight and bringing us together for, for what's a really important conversation uh, that's at the tip of the tongues of many of the Pacific Island Forum's uh, leaders, the presidents, prime ministers of this part of the world. 
So uh, as Virginia mentioned, I'm from the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. Uh, the Pacific Island Forum has uh, 18 member countries that we uh, represent and spanning that full blue Pacific continent. Um, our membership uh, covers from you know, Perth in the west to Papaete in French Polynesia in the east, from Wellington in New Zealand in the south, all the way up to Papua New Guinea, Marshall Islands, uh, etc. in the north. And we cover around 20% of the Earth's surface collectively. Um, amongst our membership, we have four of the six most disaster-prone countries in the world, uh, with uh, climate change proving to be our single greatest threat to the security of Pacific peoples, and we are truly at the front line of that fight. A number of our members experience enduring poverty and development challenges. Education outcomes are, in many instances, well below global standards, and our health statistics paint a very dire picture of life for many Pacific Island peoples. And despite our relative isolation, as Virginia mentioned, or, or maybe because of it, uh, transnational organised crime is also an enduring threat to the well-being of all Pacific peoples. And Pacific Island leaders have long recognised this as a significant challenge. They've reiterated that uh, prioritisation they put on this issue in the 2050 Strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, which was released uh, in July 2022 in the 2018 Boy Declaration on Regional Security, and even back to 1992 in the Honiara Declaration on Law Enforcement, or even further to 1971 when our forebears established the Pacific Island Chiefs of Police Network to help us work together to combat some of these crime issues. And it's great to see Nick Brown from the PICP Secretariat online as well today. <clears throat> in the Pacific, transnational organised crime undermines human and personal security, it undermines democracy, it undermines the rule of law, it exacerbates other threats experienced, as I've just mentioned. It diverts political attention and resources funding uh, away from our development and the delivery of basic services and infrastructure, and it entrenches inequalities, injustice and poverty. Um, just last week, uh, we were uh, privileged to receive the Transnational Organised Crime Threat Assessment uh, released by the Un United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, which built really on the good work of our own regionally developed assessments from the Pacific Fusion Centre, from the um, Pacific Transnational Crime Coordination Centre, and indeed by some of the good work done by uh, GITOC as well. And these assessments have all highlighted that we continue to be uh, afflicted in many of the, by many of those same transnational organised crime challenges that we have uh, been for the past several decades. Drug trafficking, human trafficking, financial crimes, environmental crimes, and increasingly uh, crimes in the cyber domain continue to make the lives of Pacific peoples far worse. <clears throat> It's important to note that in that uh, recent talk, uh, there are some subtle but in very important differences. For example, we assess at the moment that the TNOC situation has been further exacerbated by the economic challenges of COVID-19, by demographic changes, including different migration patterns, by the emergence of modern technologies, by increasing corruption, and of course, as I mentioned, by the effects of climate change that pace, place increasing strains on our, our communities, peoples, on our state institutions, et cetera. And there's a number of real examples of that. We've seen after a short lull during COVID-19, we've seen a lot of uh, large detection and seizures of illicit drugs in the region. We've seen drug use by Pacific Islanders increasing, in particular with methamphetamines. We're seeing uh, new psychoactive substances uh, being detected across the region, and we're seeing uh, criminal groups using technology, including the dark web and cryptocurrencies to facilitate transnational crime, to target Pacific Island governments. Even the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, I work, has uh, not been immune to those challenges. And so I suppose the question is, what does it mean for us as a region here on the Blue Pacific Continent? Well, I think there's a few things. Firstly, it means that uh, our police forces and our law enforcement are, are getting better at detecting the movement of illicit substances of these transnational crimes across the region because we are picking them up more often. But it also means that we know that these organised criminal groups are evolving and they're using more sophisticated means of technology, et cetera, uh, to enhance their uh, methods of, of criminal activity. So I think we, we, we find at the forum 
that the bottom line is we just have to keep working together and strengthening our approaches to trans uh, to to disrupt transnational organised crime. We know that we will always be constrained by our resources, uh, which are limited across our region. We know that we have to do more with less, and we know that we have to streamline, coordinate, work together, and we've got to do that better than we ever have before. And so, as Virginia mentioned, that's why earlier this year, um, the forum working right across our membership with all of our technical agencies developed and then launched in April our Pacific Regional Transnational Organised Crime Disruption Strategy. For the first time ever in that strategy, we've developed a regional definition of organised crime, which is framed around the UN recognised definition, but contextualised for the Pacific. For the first time ever, we're introducing a harm minimisation approach to addressing TNOC with a number of our members. Uh, and that's an important shift, uh, which really requires a whole of government, whole of society approach, rather than just relying on our very stretched law enforcement uh, capabilities across the region as well. We urge all our members, uh, all our 18 members and all of our partners uh, to use the regional strategy. It's available on our forum website and uh, we want people to use it to help inform the types of interventions that are needed at a national and local level across the Blue Pacific continent. We regularly urge all of our donors and our partners to ensure that resources that are being provided to support members achieve their national TNOC priorities uh, are done so in line with that priority, uh, with that uh, strategy, sorry. And we also want to see partners and donors, et cetera, working to support our mandated, recognised regional law enforcement secretariats, like the Chiefs of Police, which I mentioned before, like the Pacific Immigration uh, Development Community, like the Oceania Customs Organisation, the Foreign Fisheries uh, Agency, and so on. And we want to see them supported to lead the technical support to our members, because those organisations have the experience, the local contacts, the mandate to support our members on these issues. And we we find over that long history, as I said, the Pacific Island Chiefs of Police is well over 50 years old now, um, that they have that experience uh, to provide the most effective, sustainable platforms for enhancing regional security cooperation. And so it's great to see a number of those institutions represented uh, here today. Uh, now, I know we don't have too long, so I'll, I'll finish up just with a, a quick summary of those two points. Firstly, please look at our uh, regional transnational organised crime disruption strategy. It's on the Forum Sec website um, and it's available for all to see. Please proliferate it, put it on your bedside table, read it to your kids, your uh, partners, and really absorb it and, um, and, and look at ways that yourselves, your organisations can uh, join us in this fight against transnational organised crime. And please strongly consider working very closely with the existing institutions that we have here in the Pacific, like those that I mentioned and some others uh, that I've no doubt missed um, to help address these issues. Uh, so with that, again, thanks very much to GI Talk. Uh, thanks to our UN partner agencies. Thanks to the regional uh, security secretariats and and you know all the public that have joined uh, for tonight. Tumboko, Venakoglevu, Tagitumas, and um, thank you from the Pacific Island Forum. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, that was very, very helpful and informative. And also it's very important really to emphasize all the different organizations. Of course, this is a small session. We didn't have the opportunity to bring everyone uh, on board for this one, but indeed there are so many uh, actors with uh, specialized uh, agendas that have a big role to play uh, in fighting uh, organized crime across, across the region. So without further ado, I now turn to the next speaker, uh, Nicholas Brown, who is a seasoned New Zealand police officer and now is the executive director of the Pacific Island Chiefs of Police. So, Nick, over to you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, can you hear me OK? Excellent. That's great. Um, look, um, thank you, Virginia, and thank you to GI Talk. Um, as Michael said, this is a really important um, event for us. And, and uh, yeah, look, it's um, a really good opportunity for uh, me as the Executive Director for the Pacific Islands Chiefs of Police. Just let people uh, know of what the Chiefs are currently thinking around transnational organised crime and, and where we want to uh, concentrate our efforts to try and deal with this. So, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, esteemed colleagues, thank you for this opportunity to present 
on behalf of the Pacific Islands Chiefs of Police, or PICP as we refer uh, refer to it as. Uh, it's an honour to be here today to discuss our role in addressing one of the most pressing challenges of our time, uh, transnational organised crime, or uh, TNOC, as we sometimes call it. Uh, as the ED for PICP, I'm privileged to work alongside uh, oh. a number of esteemed colleagues and represent the 22 uh, chiefs or member countries, uh, each representing diverse communities across the Pacific region. Uh, together, we face a unique set of challenges that test our resilience, uh, but we also have the tremendous opportunity to cooperate, grow, and build safe communities across our Blue Pacific. And that's really, really important to every one of the chiefs. I know that. So, I suppose the question is uh, are we seeing a growing threat of TNOC in the Pacific? Well, the Pacific is not immune to the expanding global reach of transnational organised crime. I think the only place that probably won't suffer it so much will be Antarctica. Uh, but we've witnessed how TNOC networks exploit the vulnerabilities in our region. Geographical isolation, limited resources and a vast maritime space are uh, just as a breeding ground for this uh, for, for TNOC uh, organisations to really uh, take hold. These criminal organisations traffic drugs, as we know, weapons and people using our waters as pathways for their illicit trade, uh, further undermining our stability. Uh, the impact of TNOC reaches deep into our communities, uh, creating social harm, increasing corruption and fueling violence. However, this makes TNOC, what makes TNOC particularly insidious in the Pacific is the way it intersects with other criminal activities, such as environmental crime, and illegal, unregulated or unreported fishing. Now, these crimes not only degrade our natural resources, but also impact on the livelihoods of our people. Our fisheries are a vital source of food and income for our communities, and their exploitation by criminal networks is a direct threat to our sustainable development. So if we accept that TNOC remains an issue for chiefs and for us all, what are some of the challenges we're facing in terms of combating TNOC? So the BICP chiefs are absolutely committed to addressing transnational organised crime issues. But it would be no surprise, we do face significant challenges. Resource constraints are at the top of the list. Many of our police forces or services are under-resourced. They often lack the specialist equipment or training needed to combat well-financed criminal networks. For example, forensics capability, as well as the storage and destruction of drugs remains a very live issue for us in the region. Additionally, our police officers, many of whom serve in multiple roles due to staffing shortages, must balance routine policing duties with the increasing complexity demands, of, sorry, the increasing complex demands of investigating and disrupting TNOC. As we know, TNOC investigations are by their very nature complex and challenging. And they are very and very often they require specialist training. And when coupled with small workforces, really challenge small organizations. So just by way of context, our largest police organization is around 19,000 members. The smallest is nine. And the majority of members are comparatively modest in size. They are not big organizations with a lot of money. Another challenge is the regional region size uh, and geography. As uh, Michael says, I said earlier, uh, the Pacific comprises thousands of islands spread across millions of square kilometres of ocean. This isolation makes it difficult to effectively monitor and secure borders, particularly in terms of maritime security. Criminal organisations understand this, and they take advantage of our limited capacity for surveillance and enforcement. But despite these challenges, uh, the BICP continues to make strides through regional cooperation, and that's the key. The strength of the BICP lies in our collective resolve in terms of the 22 chiefs and the resolve of our partner agencies, such as the Pacific Island Forum, the Oceanic Customs Organisation, Pacific Immigration Development Community, the Forum Fisheries Agency, as well as our colleagues at the Pacific Islands Law Officers Network, PLON who represent high-ranking members of the judiciary across the region. Our mission is not just about policing, 
It's about working together as law enforcement partners, not only across our region, but uh, in terms of developing global allies to create these safer communities that we all really desire and want. The cornerstone of the cooperation, as I mentioned is, uh, earlier, is information sharing. Criminal networks don't respect borders, and neither can we if we want to be successful. The PICP has facilitated platforms uh, where our members can share intelligence, resources, and best practices to better combat TNOC. A notable initiative is the Pacific Transnational Crime Network, a collaboration that brings together police, customs and immigration agencies to track and disrupt organised crime across the region. This network is one of the most significant tools for identifying and responding to criminal activities in real time and is 22 years old. Uh, we're very proud of the uh, PTCM uh, and the PTCCC, so the Pacific Transnational Crime Coordination Centre based in Apia and Samoa. Beyond this, we've also strengthened relationships with key international partners, including Interpol and the United Nations Office on Drug and uh, Crime, so UNODC. These partnerships provide critical training, funding, and technical expertise <clears throat> excuse me, that enhance our capability to combat TNOC. Recently, Chiefs endorsed the Interpol Blue Pacific Programme, uh, an initiative that will see the use of Interpol across our 22, uh, sorry, our 11 Interpol members in the PICP grow and grow significantly. The tools and capability Uplift Interpol will bring to the region will be a significant force multiplier. But we also equally need to be alert to the displacement effect that that may bring uh, as those uh, NCBs uh, really uh, start to uh, perform to their maximum. Without doubt, our approach to tackling TNOC must be multifaceted. First, we need to continue investing in case capacity building. Uh, the PICP is committed to building the skills and leadership potential of our officers, equipping them with the knowledge they need to investigate complex crime syndicates and secure our maritime borders. This includes ensuring that women and police are empowered to take on leadership roles reflecting the importance of diversity and in strengthening our collective capabilities. And again, we're very, very proud of our Women's Advisory Network and our Generative Family Harm Programs, which are two key planks and priorities of the commissioners. Second, we must focus on prevention as much as enforcement. We're working closely with communities, civil society and local leaders, including church leaders, we can prevent vulnerable individuals from being exploited by criminal networks. Education and social programs and a focus on root causes of crime, such as poverty and, and unemployment, are key in this regard. Third, we need to further integrate technology solutions to our policing strategies. Advanced maritime surveillance systems, real-time data analysis, and modern communication tools will allow us to better monitor our borders and respond quickly to threats. And finally, a whole of government approach is critical. Policing alone cannot solve the problem of TNOC. We need the continued and coordinated effort across governments involving ministries of justice, foreign affairs, immigration, and more. This ensures that we have not just the police, but also the legal frameworks, economic policies, and community support necessary to disrupt TNOC at its roots. So the way forward or in conclusion, while the challenge of transnational organised crime is immense, and there's no understating that, Pacific Islands Chiefs of Police remain steadfast in our commitment to confronting it. Uh, through continued cooperation, capacity building and innovation, we can, and I think we will, disrupt criminal networks that threaten our communities. We recognise that combating TNOC is not a short-term battle. It's a long-term endeavour that requires sustained effort, resources and partnership, and partnership with a capital P. But without a shared vision, which is our Blue Pacific Safety, safety but with our shared vision, our Blue Pacific Safety Together, I'm confident that we can rise to the challenge. Together we can ensure our communities are not only protected from the scourge of organised crime, 
but they can thrive in safety and security and peace and really contribute to the global economies. So thank you very much, uh, Virginia. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Nick. Really appreciated your, your input. Uh, I, I can see the Commander Khaleesi has, uh, no, is no longer with us, so perhaps we'll skip to the next um, uh, speaker. I'll invite now Mr. Josiah Nagulevo uh, to, to offer his remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Virginia. I, I trust that you are able to hear me uh, adequately. Uh, but I must, I must start by saying that I thank the uh, Global Initiative and you as well, Virginia, for inviting me to be part of this virtual event and to share my perspective about uh, regional approaches to the topic uh, of combating transnational organized crime in the Pacific. I will preface my remarks by saying that the topic lends itself to what I regard as, uh, as practical and pragmatic solutions to combating emergent threats of trans transnational organized crimes in the Pacific. I shall not therefore dwell on the recent cases, nor the emerging issues and developments concerning transnational organized crimes, which have been the subject of considerable amount of research and academic discourse, as well as written literature, but instead attempt to clarify and highlight the challenges and propose strategies for law enforcement agencies. The perspective that I will share is from one who has practiced in the field of criminal prosecution in the Pacific region from, for some years, during which I have worked closely with both national and international investigators in single domestic and joint multilateral investigations. The prosecution of those investigators as a result of the least mentioned Operation Lograna in Fiji in 2000, in the year 2000, where a joint uh, operation uncovered 365 kilograms of first-class heroin, Operation Outrigger in Fiji in 2004, and the Bangladesh, Bangladeshi human trafficking case in Vanuatu recently are a few of the cases that I was involved in. My remarks then this afternoon will focus on the challenges and the strategies for investigators and prosecutors in the region. I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I acknowledge the work of the Forum Subcommittee on Regional Security, F. SRS established in 2019 under the Bow Declaration and its oversight of the Bow Declaration Action Plan. But given the scope of this presentation and the time that I have, I'm only able to cover uh, a few of those uh, matters that were covered in the, in the document, and namely strategic priority number three and policy objective 1.2 of the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat's Transnational Organized Crime Strategy. The strategic priority number three recognizes and highlights the need to build capacity on, of law enforcement agencies to effectively investigate and prosecute transnational organized crime. And I believe this can only be achieved by providing suitable training, both theoretical and practical, in the range of knowledge and skills required by professionals to combat and dismantle transnational organized crime, as well as developing and embedding best practice guidelines for investigators and prosecutors. These details are not presently reflected in the published documents of the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. They must therefore be included, uh, they, 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 they must include the understanding of various transnational organized crime typologies and, abil and ability to uh, analyze and comprehend 
a set of complex facts and to undertake forensic analysis of the evidence that would enable one to understand the legal and the factual issues and build a robust prosecution brief. Additionally, the ability to obey, obtain evidence located abroad through a process of mutual legal assistance, the ability to obtain, preserve and present admissible digital and physical evidence in court. And this must include compliance with ISO standards in relation to the preservation of, of the processing and preservation of standards of, of uh, digital evidence. And the ability where necessary to understand different corporate structures and corporate financing that may be utilized during the course of the offending, including the understanding of effective uh, identification of be beneficial owners and the use of multiple layers of corporate structures to co conceal their nefarious conduct and the ability to undertake financial analysis and obtain evidence through the process of forensic accountant, accounting and the ability to undertake effective conviction-based and non-conviction-based application in the civil courts. On the question of laundering tainted assets, there is no doubt that denying offenders their illicit funds and assets are perhaps the most effective deterrence, couple of course, with the physical incarceration of the offenders. Sadly though, law enforcement agencies in the region have been slow and sometimes shy to use, utilize and enforce existing money laundering laws. It perhaps, it is perhaps not so surprising therefore that international criminals and their domestic partners continue to be motivated by the large, by the large amount of financial gains they make and are able to keep as well. As suggested, a few successful forfeitures of large assets have the capacity to co convey the message that crime never pays. The question I ask is, why is it that the primary focus has always been on apprehending the perpetrator only, whilst the illicit gains are rarely addressed? What I've outlined above comprise the basic skills required to be built and enhanced for the successful investigation and prosecution of transnational organized crime. The shortcomings and capacity I suggest can perhaps be best addressed by targeted regional training and in-country technical advisories, as well as the provision of professional expert support in areas such as digital forensics and forensic accounting, accounting on a case-by-case -case basis. In relation to the question of legal framework, a review of existing domestic laws must be undertaken and model provisions and legislations developed under the auspices of the BOW Action Plan in the same way as the early, earlier Honiara Declaration was implemented with the help of the Pacific Island Law Officers Network. Perhaps a mutual review process like that employed by the Financial Action Task Force can be, can be adopted as a mechanism for ongoing regular review of those legislations. In relation to the alignment with international uh, communities or uh, environment, effort must be made to develop uh, international cooperation mechanisms for international co cooperation beyond the Pacific region and seek to cover regions where international assistance might be sought in relation to documentary, physical evidence, as well as possible testimonies, such as North and South America and certain parts of Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, within the short time I was allowed, those are the, 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 the contributions that I had hoped to make uh, this afternoon. And thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much. That was very, very helpful. And it sounds like you were reading my mind because I had a question forming in my head, which was really about uh, collaboration with uh, regions beyond uh, beyond the Pacific. And you, in fact, uh, highlighted you know, Latin America and parts of Asia, for instance. And and I know that the other we had two other speakers who are unfortunately experiencing some technical problems, so it looks like they won't be able to join us all, like to launch into uh, the question and answers. And perhaps I'll start with a question on my own, which is just linked to this uh, question of um, wider cooperation. And this is for all three of you. So really building on this idea of collaborating with uh, you know Asia and, and Latin America, what are the measures or the forms of collaborations or channel, channels of communication Communication that already exists, and what more uh, would you uh, like to to see that you think would be helpful? I'm thinking, for instance, in the case of drugs, you know, the re collaboration with regions where uh, drug uh, originate. Uh, I don't know who would like to um, to to go first. Um, my, uh, Nick, of course, go ahead. Thanks, Virginia. Yeah, look, I don't think anybody is under any illusion that we need to collaborate more more globally to make sure that uh, we tackle transnational organised crime, uh, particularly drugs. Um, the Pacific don't have a drug problem. Uh, the Pacific are experiencing a global drug problem. Uh, so, that, you know, the reality is uh, the majority of drugs uh, that have been consumed in the region come uh, from out of the region. Uh, and we've gone from being a transit point in a lot of cases uh, to being now consumers. And that's going to be a major problem for the future, particularly when you look at this, the, uh, the, the probably the challenges around uh, social investment in respect to rehabilitation and, and just even basic uh, uh, sort of drug rehab. I think there are a number of bilateral agreements and relationships that currently exist between various police organisations and uh, some very effective uh, police organisations around the globe. Uh, I know that um, there's been some really good and robust conversations with a number of police organisations based out of South America. Uh, and so, I mean, these people are, have been living uh, drugs uh, and illicit drugs and how to enforce uh, and take action against drug uh, offenders uh, for the last 20, 25 years. Coming back to what Josiah said earlier, and I, he's right on the money in respect to when you have a police organisation with nine people, you do not have the luxury of having somebody dedicated to transnational organised crime investigation. It's as simple as that. And many of our organisations do not have the numbers of people that can be dedicated to transnational organised crime investigations, particularly when they start to get uh, very technical. So, for example, cyber training, uh, cyber uh, criminals, cyber investigations, crypto, um, crypto offending, these are all really, really technical crime types that even uh, countries like New Zealand and Australia uh, just picking those two out of the air, are really um, fine challenging. So, you know, if you've got big policing organisations finding it challenging, uh, the smaller ones are, are finding it very, very challenging. So, yeah, I think um, no one underestimates the fact that we need to have these partnerships. And as I said in my presentations, uh, the key to this is partnerships with the big P. Uh, our um, most recent uh, chair, uh, Commissioner Shane McLennan from Tonga, who launched the tra Transnational Organised Crime Disruption Strategy at uh, one of our um, PIF meetings, uh, made it really, really clear that no commissioner can do it by themselves, no donor can do it by themselves. This is a shared problem by the chiefs, and that's the beauty of BICP as a regional body. So thanks so much for that. Thanks. Uh, Michael, would you like to add anything? Yeah, thanks, um, Virginia. Look, I mean, Nick's talked really well um, and in and, and, and some very really, uh, useful, clear English about what uh, the challenges are on the ground to that cooperation. Um, <clears throat> we know that and appreciate that and, uh, you know, that sort of uh, that is built into uh, the reality um, of how we've developed the transnational organised crime um, disruption strategy. Sorry, one second. 
um sorry it's uh early evening in the uh, this part of the world um and but but to be very clear on the at the strategic level at the leaders level uh with the pacific island forum leaders there is a very clear continued reaffirmed time and time again commitment uh for countries of this region all of the 18 members of the pacific island forum uh to work together uh, and do what it takes to help uh, eliminate and disrupt um, transnational organised crime. So those leaders have made it very clear to their police chiefs, to their immigration heads, to their customs heads, time and time and time again, that we should be sharing, we should be doing what we can with the resources that we have available um, to to work together um, when when and where necessary. Um, and we repeat that uh, time and time again to all of the partners that come to the region. The forum has uh, 21 forum dialogue partners at the moment and many others that uh, are coming to the region and have interest in supporting uh, the Pacific Island Forum member countries on our priorities. And uh, we continue to highlight to them that uh, we have an established um uh, architecture that includes the likes of PICP, OCO, PIDC, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that we have now, uh, in particular, a very detailed uh, strategy against um, transnational organised crime, and, and that's how we want to go forward. So at that high level, uh, it's very clear uh, mandate, very clear uh, repeated prioritisation of this issue, um, and but also a, a, a recognition that there are some significant operational and working level challenges for everyone uh, as well. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Negoleva, would you like to add anything? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Virginia. Just to uh, give some context to the uh, to my response to the question that you've asked. Uh, for prosecutors and investigators, without evidence of the origin of this uh, narcotics, for example, uh, and where they go ultimately, it, it impacts on the quality of the evidence that one has to prepare, present in court. So yes, we definitely need the collaboration, collaboration and the assistance that can be given by our partners in within the region and outside the region as well. Uh, in, in terms of uh, architecture, uh, I've always wondered how uh, Europe have, has for many years been able to uh, uh, coordinate and facilitate international assistance through uh, the organization called, called Eurojust. Now Asia has also developed a Asia Just. Why can't the Pacific develop a PAC Just, for example, for want of a better term, to uh, support and coordinate international assistance within the Pacific region. Uh, when, when, when that is possible, then you can use PACTAS to then connect with the other uh, international organizations for, for, uh, for, for cooperation, either at the police level or at the justice level. Uh, I, I don't think it's, a, it's impossible. Uh, perhaps we could... Uh, uh, explore opportunities here within the Pacific about developing our own system. There is none at the moment. Uh, we rely on uh, on statutes to connect us with uh, other Pacific Island countries. And uh, yes, as a result of one year of declaration, we were able to develop some of these laws that has assisted us over the last few years. But I think we need to uh, then uh, go beyond that and support Pacific Island countries, particularly investigators and prosecutors in the work that uh, they do uh, by you know, through mechanisms such as this, through perhaps a pack just. Uh, maybe uh, that is located within PIFs, I, I don't know. But it's something that I would like to uh, explore with uh, with uh, our colleagues this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, this is a very uh, interesting proposition and uh, something to ponder on. Uh, there are a few questions that have been coming through uh, from the audience, and I'm conscious that we are running out of time. I'll try to at least uh, address uh, one that's been posed by uh, Michael Main, who is, has plenty of expertise work and experience working in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. And this question is uh, particularly for, uh, for Nick. Uh, what is the extent of role of illegal firearm trades in the Pacific? And of course, he's thinking particularly at the highlands in uh, in PNG. So, how much is known and understood about this um, trade network? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Michael. And I'd love to be able to say that I've got a very rich data set that we'd be able to share with you to be able to really explain and and inform you as to how bad or how big the problem was. I think again. Uh, that's probably one of the challenges that we are experiencing. And again, it comes off, comes, uh, I suppose it, it represents the trade offs that governments and police commissioners and others need to, uh, that, that, that play out in terms of do they invest in a really uh, capable um, sort of data center that can. Uh, aggregate all this information and store all this information or do they invest in a uh, lifting uh, medical care in the local hospitals and that sort of thing. I think, I suppose what I'm trying to say is we are a very data poor region. There's no two ways about that. And I think every commissioner would, would agree with that um, sentiment. Some are better than others, uh, but to answer Michael's question directly, uh, that is, I don't think we really are well informed. I think uh, the best way of addressing uh, that particular issue, particularly with uh, PNG, is to probably engage with um, uh, with the PNG, RPG, uh, PNGC, uh, because they would be the closest, you know, in terms of being able to understand what that looks like. Uh, so probably not the best answer, uh, but... Um, Hopefully that does answer the question. Thank you, uh, Nick. And then I'd like to just pose a final question to uh, to to everyone. This comes from Louise Taylor, and this is about the comments that was made about tackling uh, transnational crime as a through a whole of society uh, approach. In your experience, how uh, how easy or difficult is it to take that whole of society approach uh, forward? Do you find Pacific populations are understanding or supportive of of the fight against transnational crime? Is this seen as a as a priority issue? Um, how are you intending on fostering a whole of society approach? Any takers? <laughs> Uh, Michael, I'm, I'm hearing uh, silence, so I'll, I'll I'll start, but I will rely on the experts uh, on the panel to to fill in the gaps that I uh, are many and varied uh, in my um, experience on this. But I just reflect on recent experience in Fiji, where there's been a real uh, surge, uh, a reported surge in um, in methamphetamine usage, uh, uh, particularly around Suva, but uh, right across the country. We've seen it over the last three years there. It has become a front page news uh, almost every day. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing regular, regular uh, reporting from all parts of the country and from all parts of society. What's been interesting uh, as an observer there uh, with an interest in that game is that the reporting is not just coming from police. It's coming from church leaders, from uh, traditional uh, leaders, from uh, within the chiefly system, it's coming from concerned mums and dads. Reporting's coming from health workers who are working in the hospitals around the country, uh, and so we are seeing a a level of concern right across society um, that is being amalgamated and has led to uh, the leadership in Fiji placing this as one of their highest priority issues uh, at present. And so from that. Uh, Fiji is working on a range of uh, strategies, including a national uh, drug strategy, to um, to to find a way to ameliorate the risk to address it. And they will be calling on all of those concerned parties and stakeholders to take the lead. I'd pass to Nick and uh, Josiah to to 
extrapolate on that further and with examples from other parts of the region. But I think one of the benefits in the Pacific is, you know, sorry, as, as we said before, one of the challenges that we have is that we're small, but that can also be a great benefit because our communities are still very much intact. They're still working together hand in hand um, across the, the different um, layers of society. And also, actually, a building on what you just said, Michael, about the uh, methamphetamine um, uh, use in Fiji that is also linked to a spike in HIV um, cases, which uh, really makes it the, the issue of transnational crime mo even more real to everyday people because it impacts directly their uh, their health. Um, uh, Nick, um, anything to, to add on the whole of society uh, approach? Yeah, I think, um, look, as I think we've all sort of touched in various ways, uh, this problem of transnational organised crime is, is more than just policing, more than just law enforcement. It is a whole of society approach to this. I think there are a number of programmes that have uh, occurred both domestically and various jurisdictions uh, where... Um, it's a matter of building resilience to organised crime within the community. Uh, it's looking at those community leaders uh, that can champion the message around um, uh, being resilient to uh, the, I suppose, the attractiveness of being involved in an organised crime group uh, and f to really inform uh, potential victims uh, of what the likely outcome will be for them in terms of uh, consuming, facilitating, trafficking drugs or being part of the periphery to that, whether that be prostitution, et cetera, et cetera. Like you say, uh, Virginia, I think where it really starts to hit home is when it starts to affect people's health. And as I said earlier, uh, the region's not equipped for the, a level of uh, drug consumption uh, that we've seen in other places. Uh, and so that is going to be, it, it has to be essentially a whole of community uh, approach to trying to deal with this issue. So they, 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 that's what I suppose I'd summarise it all up. Thank you. Mr Nagulevo, you have the final word. Thank you very much, Virginia. I, I don't have uh, very much to, to add, uh, but I think I echo what Michael had said in his uh, observation of your your question. Uh, obviously, drug consumption in Fiji, I actually come from Fiji, uh, is such a, uh, uh, a big issue uh, for whole of society. And I think everybody recognizes how, what, uh, you know, how, how much they need to be involved in if we are going to uh, earnestly and uh, seriously deal with this issue. So uh, I, I note, Virginia, you, you said about uh, health issues connected to this, HIV. Uh, there's obviously rehabilitation uh, 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 questions that need to be brought into the conversation as well. And I think the, the other concerning part is demographics, how a lot of young people, very young people, have in fact uh, uh, become consumers and have actually been victims of this drug uh, uh, problem uh, in Fiji. I think that's all I, I needed to, uh, I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Virginia. Well, no, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all really for your input. We've really reached the end of the, uh, of the allotted time. And I personally really enjoyed the conversation. I hope we had more time and I know there are more, more uh, questions coming in from, from the audience really highlighting how much interest there is in, in this issue and really uh, uh, this you know to me felt almost like a taster of course we could have a much uh, lengthier discussion involving a wider range of um, actors from within and also beyond uh, beyond the region so but for now i'd like really to thank you all again for for taking part in this uh, side event on combating transnational crime uh, in the uh, in the pacific region uh, Thank you to the to the audience and uh, well I'll see you at the next discussion. All the best.